Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. I don't even really know what to call this. It's not a deep dive because it's only going to be one video, but it's not really a coffee and crime time because it's two different cases and it's going to be a longer video than a typical coffee and crime time. I don't know what to call this video besides to say that it was supposed to be a different video, right? Let me tell you a little bit what happened. This video was going to be very different. It was going to be about a completely different case, the disappearance of five-year-old Michael Vaughn, who was last seen in July of 2021. And just this week, an arrest was made in connection to his disappearance. And I'm still going to make that video, but I definitely want to wait for a bit to get more information, uh, some confirmation on some details. They're doing some excavation right now. They say it's going to take a while. And until I kind of have a better understanding of what's going on, I don't want to make that video yet because there's a lot going on with this case. Uh, some details are still fuzzy and there's things happening. We just don't really know exactly what they mean yet, although I have my own suspicions. However, Michael's case Michael's case brought me to another missing persons case, Xavier Harrelson, who disappeared just days before his 11th birthday in May of 2021. And then Xavier's case, that brought me to a more well-known case, the disappearance of 20-year-old Molly Tibbetts. And don't ask me how one thing led to the other. Um, I probably couldn't even tell you. Like, definitely I could tell you how Xavier and Molly's cases connected or led to each other. But I don't know how I got from um, Michael Vaughn to Xavier Harrelson. I, I couldn't tell you exactly. I'm glad I did, though. Because there's enough odd circumstances swirling around Xavier Harrelson and Molly Tibbetts that I think it's well worth the time to sit down and discuss these two cases in depth and determine whether or not we think there is a potential connection, which some people have claimed, and whether this potential connection means everything, something, or nothing. And honestly, as I'm sitting here, I still don't really know where to start. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about. And I have a feeling that this is going to be a long video. So let's have a quick word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV, before we dive in. Magellan TV is truly a hidden treasure in the streaming world. It's the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play, and it offers the best value of any premium documentary streaming service in both price and quality. And I'm going to be honest with you, there's a lot of reasons for the hype. First of all, Magellan TV is about the drama of real life, and they have some of the best documentary series and films I've ever seen, whether it's in our wheelhouse of true crime or history, travel, science, nature. And let's be honest, I think that history and science are both genres that are really true crime adjacent. For example, I've been obsessed, obsessed with Bone Detectives, an eight-episode series on Magellan TV that follows Dr. Tori Harridge and her team as they examine some of the UK's most mysterious archaeological burial sites. I am so into stuff like this. Like, you have no idea. I don't even want to start talking about it because I'm so into it. And I will say I actually got to watch some forensic work happen in real life on Bones when I was in Salt Lake City this month at Intermountain Forensics Lab. So watching this series was very timely for me. And when I tell you all eight episodes had me transfixed, I'm not being hyperbolic. One of my favorites was episode two, which discusses uh, 1,000 bodies being found during the construction of some waterfront property. Oh my God, this series is everything all in one. Mystery, crime, history, science, it's just perfect. And you can watch Bone Detectives and thousands of hours of entertaining and educational content just like it with a one month free trial of Magellan TV. All you have to do is click the link in the description box and start watching now. There's no contracts, no strings attached. You can cancel anytime you want, but I don't think you're gonna want to because not only does Magellan TV have tons of great films and series, but they add 20 plus hours of new content every single week, which is something I really don't find a lot. A lot of the times when I go in to these uh, streaming services, they have the same stuff and like maybe once a quarter they'll update, but Magellan TV updates and adds every single week. 4K is always included in your subscription and there's no ads 
ever. Plus, with the holidays right around the corner, I know I'm feeling the stress, as I always do, because it feels like you have so much time. You're like, oh, Thanksgiving's not even here yet. Christmas is like so far away. I have so much time. But the days and the weeks rush by so quickly. And then you look up and it's like the week of Christmas and I have nothing, nothing but Magellan TV will make a great gift for that documentary lover in your life. We all have one or a few of them. Magellan TV offers membership gift cards, not just now actually, but all year round. So keep that in mind for the holidays, for people's birthdays, uh, last minute occasions you forgot to get a gift for. And even if you've already signed up and started watching, which I know many of you have because we talk about the documentaries that you're loving, you can purchase Magellan TV for a friend or a family member. And Magellan TV will actually send this person the gift card in their email on the date that you decide. So you can have it sent right on their birthday, uh, right on Christmas, etc. It's honestly great. So check Magellan TV out right now. Click the link in the description box. Redeem your special offer. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video. Let's dive in. So Molly Tibbetts was actually a very um, well-known publicized case a few years back. And a lot of people have requested that I cover her case on my channel. So I remember when I saw her name, like, oh, this has been highly requested. But I don't recall why I didn't cover it. I think there was something else going on and I was kind of in the middle of of another maybe multi-parter when I started getting a lot of requests to cover her case. So I kind of, uh, you know, put it off and then never got around to actually looking deeper into it. And now that I have, wow, there is, I mean, first of all, it's completely tragic. It's incredibly sad, but it is a great case to go through. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to learn. And so I'm just going to kind of dive in and I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to proceed and how I'm going to organize this because I have all the information, but I just really, I sat there for hours and I couldn't figure out how to organize it. So I hope I do it properly. This is just so much. And I feel like I'm always stressed. I'm going to miss something or forget something or leave something out. It's the same way I feel whenever I travel and I'm packing and I always overpack because I hate not being prepared and I hate not having everything I need. And that's how I feel with these cases. So hopefully I don't leave anything out because there's just so much to cover. But let's just start and, and you know, get there together. So on July 18th, 2018, University of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts vanished while jogging in Brooklyn, Iowa. Brooklyn, Iowa is a small town of about 1,500 people located between Des Moines and Iowa City. Molly was 20 years old. She had just finished up her first year in college where she was studying to become a child psychologist. That summer was the second year where Molly was working as a camp counselor at the Unity Point Grinnell Regional Medical Center Day Camp. It's basically just a day camp for kids. And Molly was a favorite of the kids who attended the camp. In fact, they did... When she first went missing, they did interviews with some of the kids at the camp, and it was so sad because one six-year-old girl said something like, I feel like there's a crack in my heart because she missed Molly so badly. Like, oh my God, how sad. So Molly was really, really treasured by, by these children, and she was really valued by her coworkers as well. And it was actually Molly's coworkers at the camp who first noticed she was missing when she did not show up for work on July 19th, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, Molly was still living with her mother, but she was planning to get her own place. And she was also planning a lot of things for the future, including a fun trip to the Caribbean for a wedding with her boyfriend of three years, Dalton Jack. It was actually his brother's wedding, and they were, you know, planning to go on this trip together. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about Dalton Jack in a little bit, but they'd been together for three years. However, a lot of this time, at least a year of it, Molly was actually away at school, so it was long distance. And on July 18th, Molly was at her boyfriend's apartment in Brooklyn, Iowa. She was dog sitting for him because he was out of town on business. Molly had this routine of going for a run every single day, and it's believed that on this day, she left Dalton's place to begin her daily run at around 7.30 p.m. because she was seen around that time wearing dark colored running shorts, a pink sports top, and running shoes. 
Now, Molly was actually expected back home for dinner that night, um, and her mother's house was only about a mile and a half away from Dalton Jack's apartment, also in Brooklyn, Iowa. But Molly didn't show up for dinner, and it appears the last time anyone heard from her was that day or night because her boyfriend Dalton claimed he had gotten a Snapchat message from Molly around 10 p.m., and apparently there was a selfie of Molly in the Snapchat message, which Dalton said looked as if it had been taken inside his home. Now, it's important to note because I saw a lot of these comments saying like, well, how did she go out for a run at 730 if she supposedly went missing when she was out on her run if she was sending Snapchats at 10 p.m. because you would think that that meant she got home after her run if she's sending Dalton Jack Snapchats and selfies from inside his apartment at 10 p.m. But what probably happened is Dalton Jack saw and opened that Snapchat around 10 p.m., but it was probably sent much earlier. So Molly had probably sent it before she left for her run. When Molly did not show up for work on July 19th and when she didn't respond to calls or texts from family members, her mother, Laura Calderwood, actually called the police and reported her missing. That day and the next day, law enforcement and hundreds of volunteers searched the small Iowa town, but no sign of Molly was found. Because of her age, the theory was thrown around that Molly could have left of her own free will. But this was quickly dismissed by family and even law enforcement, with Mitch Mordvet, the assistant director of field operations for the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigations, saying, quote, At this point, we can't rule anything out. And from what we've learned about Molly, this is highly, highly out of character for her as far as would she walk away. We know she was a creature of habit and that she did things at similar times from day to day and ran similar routes. What we've been focusing on is revisiting those places and those routes in the hopes of finding evidence, video surveillance from local businesses and residences or people who remember seeing her so that we can try to reconstruct where she went that day and what she did, end quote. Besides requesting surveillance footage from businesses and homes in the area, law enforcement announced that they would also be combing through Molly's digital devices and social media accounts such as Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook. And this would not only give investigators an idea of who Molly had been communicating with in the days leading up to her disappearance, but they could also use the GPS on her phone and Fitbit to map out areas that she'd been in the day she vanished and even areas she'd been in in the days leading up to when she vanished. On July 26, 2018, it was announced that the warrants for Molly's digital devices were beginning to return information, and there was a lot of information to sift through in order to decide what was relevant and what wasn't. Through Molly's devices, law enforcement identified five areas of interest around Brooklyn, and Mitch Mortvet announced that he believed it was possible that Molly had come into contact with someone who had caused her harm, and he urged the public to think back on the days around Molly's disappearance to see if they could remember any strange people or vehicles around those points of interest that had been identified. However, reportedly, it did end up being the surveillance footage where a dark-colored Chevy Malibu was seen driving back and forth in the area and at the time where and when Molly was running, and this led police to an actual suspect, 24-year-old Mexican national Christian Bajina Rivera. Police took Rivera into custody, and after an 11-hour interrogation, he led detectives to a cornfield where the badly decomposed body of Molly Tibbetts was found hidden under some corn stalks. The autopsy showed that Molly had been stabbed 7 to 10 times in her chest, ribs, neck, and skull, and she was fully dressed when she was found, except for one shoe. And it was in that cornfield where Rivera allegedly told Officer Pamela Romero that he had seen Molly as she was running. He had thought that she was attractive. I think he actually referred to her as being hot. So he followed her. At one point, he got out of his car and began running after Molly on foot, at which time she became alarmed and tried to call the police on her cell phone. And when he got close to her, Molly allegedly began screaming at him and slapping him, which caused Rivera to become angry. He blacked out 
and apparently when he came to, Molly was dead, murdered, with what Special Agent Trent Valletta described as a sharp object believed to be a knife, although that weapon was never recovered. He did not tell you that he remembered putting her in the trunk. He stated that he did not remember putting her inside the car. He did not remember how she got there, but he, does, he did remember how he took her out of the vehicle. Okay. I asked him how the, um, her body felt uh, against his body when he was carrying her. He s told me that it felt like a person that had just fainted. Did the defendant ever tell you or uh, remember for you any weapon that was used to cause the injuries to Molly Tibbetts that would have caused her to bleed? No, he did not. He couldn't remember it? He could not remember. Is it fair to say, uh, Ms. Romero, that uh, in your conversation with Christian Rivera roadside at the cornfield uh, that the recall by the defendant was um, not complete? Yes, I was trying to get more, more details from him. Okay. And it was not complete in terms of he never discussed a weapon that was used to harm Molly Tibbetts? That is correct. Uh, he did not provide you turn by turn um, a drive that he took to the cornfield, correct? Correct. Uh, and there may have been some other details left out, is that right? Yes, that's what I was understanding. What was found, however, was blood in the seal of the trunk of Rivera's Chevy Malibu, blood that was a DNA match for Molly Tibbetts, according to Tara Scott, a criminalist in the DNA section of Iowa's crime lab. In fact, Tara Scott said that the blood in the trunk liner matched Molly's DNA with 1 in 8.7 no nillion certainty. No nillion. Never had I heard about that before, but I looked it up and you know, it's a lot, basically. A no nillion is a one followed by 30 zeros. So pretty much like without a doubt, that's Molly's blood, that's Molly's DNA. And interestingly enough, even though Rivera would later plead not guilty, he never denied that Molly's dead body was in his trunk. You'll see why in a minute. Now, police did find a knife and a bloody napkin in Rivera's home. The knife tested negative for blood, and the blood on the napkin was not Molly's, it was Rivera's. Additionally, there was no sperm found on Molly or her clothing, so it doesn't appear that this attack was sexually motivated, or at least um, whoever did this to her, allegedly Christiane Rivera, did not uh, sexually assault her at the time of her death. The arrest of Christian Bejena Rivera came as a surprise to many people, um, but some people not so much. So who is this person, you know, this man who allegedly followed Molly Tibbetts and stabbed her to death? According to the New York Times, quote, Mr. Bahina Rivera was one of many Mexicans who have made their way to Iowa's pastures, where farmers often struggle to find eligible workers to tend to their crops and cattle. Mr. Bahina Rivera grew up in El Guayabio, a village of unpaved roads some three hours' drive from Acapulco on Mexico's Pacific coast, and attended the only elementary school in the village of about 400 people, end quote. So, Rivera was, and I mean, he, he's not dead, he's alive still, so Rivera is a Mexican national who entered the United States illegally at the age of 17 when he crossed a river into Texas on an inflatable raft with about 10 other people. And this fact, this, this one detail, Rivera being undocumented, it sent a political ripple through this case and, in my opinion, certainly took the attention off of Molly Tibbetts a bit. But I'm not even going to say that this shouldn't have been a concern for some people, people who live in the area. You know, I certainly don't believe that every person from outside the United States who wants to make the United States their home is a horrible criminal who's going to do horrible things. All of my father's family are immigrants. Um, my father is an immigrant. So, you know, I'm not ever going to say that. I'm not ever going to make that kind of generalization that's ignorant. But, 
just by the law of averages, of course there's some bad people crossing the border and entering the United States. There's good people and there's bad people, just like there's good people that live here and bad people that live here. That should not be a hot take. That should not be controversial, but it seems like it is nowadays. And this whole um, situation poses a problem because those bad people who are crossing into the United States, they're not in our system. We don't have their fingerprints or their DNA on file as we do with many of our own bad people, our own criminals and repeat offenders. So if a crime is committed by someone who isn't in the system, who's basically a ghost in this country, it makes it difficult to solve the crime. Even if DNA or prints are left behind, at least until that person gets arrested or caught for the first time. And sometimes even then, they aren't fingerprinted or anything at that point, depending on the crime and depending on laws in certain states. And I mean, I don't live in a border state. New York does border Canada. You know what I mean. But usually we don't have to worry about Canadians sneaking into the country. So I truly can't speak on how big of an issue it is or how you know small of an issue it is. It's really going to be situational and it's going to be about where you live and um, specifically how you and your community has been affected by that. But I can speak on the fact that I don't think what happened to Molly should have been used to further any political agenda. I don't think tragedies ever should be used like that because it feels opportunistic, as if the whole picture has been painted with too broad a stroke. And, and that is often what happens with politicians. And that's why I say, if you are somebody watching this right now and you live in a border state like Texas or Arizona or places like that where they are having these kinds of issues, I am not going to tell you that you should not be concerned and you don't have the right to be concerned because you do. But I will say whenever politicians come out and start, you know, grandstanding about a specific case, it's usually just to appease their base, who their base may be, and they never really end up doing anything about it. They just kind of use it to get people riled up and to get more votes, and, you know, they never actually do anything about it. But anyways, let's learn a little bit about Christian Bejina Rivera, who I will admit, initially when I was reading about him and his life and his background, he didn't strike me as a hardened criminal or a repeat offender or somebody, you know, that we should be concerned about coming into this country. He was 17 when he came in. How much could he have done by then? It's not like he was some drug trafficker. Um, it's not as if he was a murderer and he had a record in Mexico. It seemed just like a normal 17-year-old kid. When Rivera landed in Texas, he was just 17. He didn't speak a lot of English and he had only a middle school education. He left Texas immediately and that's when he traveled to Iowa where apparently one of his uncles lived and Rivera began began working as a farm laborer. Now, he ended up working at Yarraby Farms right outside of Brooklyn, Iowa, and this farm just so happened to be co-owned by a man named Craig Ling, who was a former Republican candidate for Iowa Agriculture Secretary. And Lang was spoken to about Rivera, and he said Rivera wasn't much for conversation, but he always got his work done on time. Federal officials reported they had no record of him entering the country legally, and they said he must have used false documents to obtain employment. And according to Mr. Lang, Rivera was hired in August of 2014 after presenting a valid social security number and a state-issued identification card, which, as it turns out, was not in his real name. You know, so he, he did use, I guess, legitimate documents. They just weren't his legitimate documents. And Rivera was reportedly working 12-hour days, seven days a week, keeping his head down for the most part. Uh, in 2013, he did meet and begin dating Iris Moneras, who, you know, was a high school student at that point, but whatever. Maybe that was a red flag. I don't know, because he was, I think, 20 at that time, but... I don't know. What but Rivera seemed to be very much in love with Iris. He called her his beautiful, cool princess on Facebook, and he said that the day he met her was the best day of his life. Rivera and Iris had a child together in 2014, a daughter who, according to locals, 
Rivera was very attentive with. He would often be seen playing with his daughter in the park. He was a good father, according to everybody who knew him. And a cousin of Iris Monera's said that Rivera was very romantic as well. And before he and Iris separated, he would often bring her flowers. This New York Times article went on to say, quote, Some in Brooklyn were perplexed by the arrest of a man many knew as a familiar, if unremarkable, face around town. Mary Jo Seaton, a former owner of a Brooklyn grocery store, said he often stopped by her store in the late afternoon or early evening, usually with two other men she presumed to be his co-workers. They would be talking to each other, smiling, laughing, and if you spoke to them or said hi, they would smile back at you, Miss Seaton said. Because they spoke Spanish and most store employees did not, she said they did not talk at length with the staff. I thought he seemed like a very nice person, a clean-cut American person, Miss Seaton said, end quote. Okay, what does that what does that mean? But there were some people who did get a weird vibe from Rivera, like 20-year-old Brooke Bestel, who claims that something about Rivera was off to her. He had once asked her out on a date and Brooke had said no, and from that point on, she said whenever she saw him in public, Rivera would not speak to her. He would just stare at her, but then he would send her Facebook messages constantly. Brooke Bestel said, quote, just over and and over, like every week or so, he would message me again, end quote. She said the most recent message she had gotten from him was June 13th, just the month before Molly Tibbetts was murdered. And that message had been sent to her at 3 a.m. Apparently, many or most of Rivera's messages would be sent in the middle of the night. And after Rivera was arrested, two of Brooke's friends told her that he had also been messaging them online. So we could definitely say that was something of a red flag, right? However, one of Rivera's friends from Mexico described him as a very good person, a simple guy with no vices. Later, when he was on trial for murder, many people took the stand to talk about Rivera's character. His ex-girlfriend Iris claimed they'd remained on good terms after breaking up. She said they still attended family events together, and Rivera shared custody of their daughter with her. He was always on time with his child support payments, and Iris said that Rivera was a good father, a really good father, a responsible person. And this was a sentiment shared by Rivera's aunt, Alejandra Cervantes Vell, who claimed her nephew was a hard worker, who was close to his family, and who was never violent. Now, of course, a million people could have come out and said that Rivera was the nicest guy in the world, a guy that would give you the shirt off of his back. And none of that would really matter. You know, it wouldn't automatically exclude him from being responsible for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. Everyone always talked about what a nice, normal guy Chris Watts was. But we know what he did. We know that he did something that very few people can understand. He did things that were unthinkable and unimaginable and unforgivable. So a bunch of positive character references, they don't mean much when stacked up against physical evidence, such as Rivera's confession, Rivera's car on surveillance video repeatedly driving by Molly as she jogged, the forensic evidence of her blood and DNA being found in the trunk of his car, him knowing where her body was, things like that. Ultimately, Rivera was arrested and charged with Molly's murder, and he pleaded not guilty, hiring husband and wife legal team Jennifer and Chad Fraze to represent him in the murder trial that would begin in May of 2021. But something else happened in May of 2021. Xavier Harrelson, a 10-year-old boy who lived in Montezuma, Iowa, vanished without a trace on May 27th, just four days before his 11th birthday. Montezuma is a town of about 1,300 people, located roughly 70 miles east of Des Moines and just 16 miles from Brooklyn, Molly Tibbetts' hometown. Reportedly, Xavier was last seen around 11 a.m. riding his bike in the area of the Spruce Village Mobile Home Park, where he lived with his mother, Sarah. From all accounts, Xavier was just the sweetest kid. And at the time of his disappearance, he had just finished fourth grade, and he was enjoying a break for the summer before going back to school in the fall. A teacher at Montezuma Elementary School said, quote, Xavier is a happy kid who gets along well with his peers and wants to please his teachers. He's always willing to help you out, engage in a conversation, and offers a smile to everyone he sees, end quote. And a lot of people talked about that. His neighbors, 
his friends, his teachers, the principal at his school, people who knew him, Xavier had a smile for everyone. He was always smiling, and you can see in his pictures, he has this great, big, really earnest and genuine smile. And he didn't ever like people to be kind of like upset. I think it was his principal who said Xavier was always telling jokes, always trying to make people laugh, even if the jokes weren't funny. He would just tell them and kind of like shoot joke after joke, trying to get a response out of somebody, a laugh out of somebody. He really liked to bring joy to people's lives. And Xavier's grandmother, Mary Weber, also described him as a considerate boy. And Mary Weber and other family members of Xavier, they were looking forward to getting to spend more time with him because apparently Xavier and his mother, Sarah, were going to be leaving Montezuma and moving to Des Moines, where Mary Weber and other relatives resided. The planned move was supposed to happen at the end of the month, the same month that Xavier went missing. And Mary Weber was getting prepared to see her grandson more often. She'd already purchased Xavier a Nintendo Switch for Christmas, and she'd gotten her living room redone. She put in a large flat screen television so when Xavier came over, he could play his video games. Mary Weber said, quote, he was a sweet and caring child. At Christmas, he went to give me a hug for giving him his Nintendo Switch, and his mom said something to him about being careful. I don't know what she said, but he turned his head sideways so he had the hood of his coat against my face when he gave me a hug to try to keep from breathing on me because of COVID. Before COVID, when we had Christmas, he was always just a happy kid. He just never asked for anything. He was always very grateful for whatever he got. End quote. And maybe Xavier was a bit more humble and down to earth for his age because of the responsibility he had when it came to his mother, Sarah. Neighbors and family members claimed Xavier acted as a caretaker to his mother, who was an amputee and wore a prosthetic leg. A neighbor and family friend named Samantha Ricks said, quote, Things she can't do, he helps her with. And Xavier knows that. And he knows that he's not just her son, he's her other leg. End quote. One of his teachers claimed that Xavier would often comment that his mom needed his help and he had to be home with her to help her. And a lot of people said, like his neighbor said, Xavier really never left the trailer park except to go to school. So it wasn't like he was going to friends' houses or he was staying after school for clubs or things like that. He was usually home. Just give me a minute, actually, because it's very cold here. It's like a blizzard. And usually being in the recording studio under the lights, it's like super hot. And I thought this turtleneck would like keep me warm enough, but I can no longer feel my fingers. So I'm going to go get a sweater and I'll be right back. Okay, so Xavier went missing at the end of May uh, 2021, and his mother, Sarah Harrelson, kept to herself for several months before speaking publicly about his disappearance in August of 2021. Sarah told the Des Moines Register that Xavier was just a kid, but he also liked to play man of the house, his mother's helper. She said that she was really missing his out-of-this-world imagination, his willingness to learn, and the meticulousness with which he did everything. She told a story about her son, a memory she had from the month before he disappeared. Sarah said that she and Xavier had just finished praying together when he walked up to her with his big infectious smile, and he told her that he loved her a Google before informing his mother that Google was a word he had just learned in school, and it meant an infinite number that just keeps going and going and going. Xavier was so smart, so sharp, his mother was sure that one day he was going to write books or movies. But now that he was gone, all she could do was ask herself, why, every single day, why did he have to be missing? Why did it have to be her son? But It is possible that the relationship between mother and child was not as rosy and warm as Sarah made it out to be, and that's where things become complicated and, if possible, more tragic. So let's go back to May 27, 2021, the day when Xavier allegedly went missing. Sarah Harrelson had started to call and ask around, trying to find out if anyone had seen her son Xavier. She claimed the last time she had seen him was around 11 that morning. She said he was riding his bike, he was wearing blue pajama pants, black high-top shoes, and a red shirt. But hours had passed and he hadn't come home and she hadn't seen him. However, 
It was not Sarah Harrelson who reported Xavier missing to the police. It was a family friend, Samantha Ricks, who ended up calling it in after Sarah refused to, or at least that is what Samantha has suggested to some uh, YouTube channels. And I believe it. I believe it. And I mean, let's be honest. It is always a red flag. It is always an eyebrow raiser when the parent of a child is not the one who reports them missing. Because honestly, I'm ready to call the police and report my kids missing when I can't see them for like two minutes. Yesterday, Aiden took the late bus and stayed after for art club, and he didn't tell me that he was going to do that, even though he usually does. And when he didn't get off the bus at the normal time, and then I started calling the school, and they said like they didn't know where he was, I was freaking out. I was about to call the police. And then I called the, the transportation department, and they were like, yeah, he's on a late bus, so... There we go. But anytime I lose sight of my kids for a minute or a couple minutes, I'm ready to call the police and report them missing because I understand that the the longer I wait, the longer away they could be potentially getting from me. And that's what I tried to explain to Aiden yesterday because he rolled his eyes because I was freaking out when he got off the bus. And he was like, you know, if I'm if I'm not home on the regular bus, just assume I'm staying and I'm on the late bus. And I went to our club and I was like, no, I'm not going to assume that. I said, because what if you got off the bus at the end of our driveway and somebody snatched you? And then I was just like, oh, I'll just wait for the late bus. And then an hour and a half later, Later, when you don't get off the late bus, that's when I start worrying. And by that time, you're an hour and a half away from me. And it's going to be harder for me to find you. I need to know where you are every minute. And you might think that I'm dramatic or overprotective. I don't care if you think that. I don't care if he thinks that. I'm going to continue being that way. So it is always to me, maybe not to everybody, maybe it's not a generalization I can make, but to me, it's always an eyebrow raiser and suspicious when the parent isn't the one who's reporting their missing child missing. And then neighbors from the Spruce Village Mobile Home Park, they began talking about their experience with the Harrelsons. Reportedly, they often heard Sarah and Xavier arguing. And the night before Xavier went missing, reportedly the two had an especially loud argument. Kevin Kautzer, who lived next door to Xavier and his mother, said, quote, There was a huge fight about 8 p.m. between Xavier and his mom, and they were shouting back and forth. Couldn't really tell what it was about, but it was really heated and went on about 20 minutes. End quote. Additionally, Xavier was known to knock on the doors of his neighbors in the trailer park and ask if he could stay the night with them. And even though Xavier's mother claimed she last saw him on the morning of May 27th, the first few phone calls she made reportedly suggested that it wasn't that morning she had last seen him, that maybe it was the night before. And no one else in the trailer park reported seeing him riding his bike around either, although they were used to seeing him ride his bike around the park many other days. Nathan Borton, another neighbor, said, quote, I've never actually seen him leave the trailer court. He usually goes up and down here and cuts off right before that street up there, end quote. So I guess the issue here is the only person who claims to have seen Xavier on May 27th is his mother, the person who didn't report him missing, the person who, you know, was heard having a loud fight with him the night before. So there's going to be a degree of suspicion there. And this suspicion deepened when Sarah Harrelson stayed out of the public eye for almost three months. And there was also the issue where on May 31st, just days after Xavier vanished and the day after he would have been celebrating his 11th birthday, Sarah changed her status on Facebook to in a relationship, prompting many to wonder what the hell she was thinking. There was a huge search for Xavier amongst the community and law enforcement. Everyone was tying orange ribbons around the town of Montezuma because orange was one of Xavier's favorite colors, and the community hoped that those ribbons would somehow guide him home. There was people out there who were strangers to Xavier, trying to raise awareness, worried sick about him, creating Facebook groups, trying to get his face and story out to a wider audience, putting posters up, raising money, But from Sarah Harrelson, for months, it was crickets. And then she's on Facebook, like not even a week after, just days after her son goes missing, changing her relationship status as if that should be a priority when your child, who's never wandered away from home before, is missing. And remember, Xavier wasn't just Sarah's son. He was 
her caretaker, her helper, her other leg, and you'd think she would at least be trying to send some message to him or to the people who took him through the media. You know, no one expected her to be on the television every day, but at least once at some point after the search to thank those who came out in droves to help, to thank a fast law enforcement response, and to let Xavier know, just in case he happened to be listening, that she loved him and that she was looking for him. And then the one interview that Sarah did give in August of 2021 had a lot of people feeling some sort of way. Sarah Harrelson says she finally has the strength to speak up for her 11-year-old son. I just want him found. Xavier's mother has remained quiet, declining interviews, except this one in August during the state fair. Do you have a theory, an idea, or where he could be? God, I wish you did. Sarah Harrelson has faced backlash for not calling police right away. What do you want to say to people that have maybe questioned you or wondered why you I have nothing to say to them because I know I'm right. We love you. We're not going to stop looking for you. We're going to find you. Yeah, so people say she seems to be maybe under the influence of something. I don't know. I mean, she could be under the influence of something. She could be under the influence of some, like, anti-anxiety drug or something like that. It doesn't need to necessarily be, like, illegal or illicit drugs. I don't, it could just be how she is. I. It didn't stand out to me. Like, Summer Wells' mother, in that interview she gave, I was like... Is this girl about to fall asleep in front of us? Like, what's going on? She's definitely under the influence of something. But with Sarah Harrelson, I wouldn't say it was something that really, like, popped into my head. That could just be how she talks and how she is. Other people say it seems as if she's not being really sincere in her concern. Do you have a theory, an idea, or where he could be? God, I wish you did. And like I said, listen, I usually like to hold back judgment in situations like this where a child is gone and a parent is getting some public scrutiny or a woman is missing and her husband immediately becomes suspect number one. But I also like to trust my instincts. They're usually spot on. And the last time my instinct was kicking me in the face like this was when this asshat got up and said he just wanted his family home. Somebody has her and they're not safe. Like, I want them back now. Like, that, that, that's what's in my head. Like, if they're safe right now, they're going to come back. But if they're not safe right now, that's, what, that's the not knowing part. Like, if they're not safe. I, I, last night, I, was, I had every light in the house on. I was hoping that I would just get, just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me, but it didn't happen. And it was just a traumatic night trying to be here. So where I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure whether she was under the influence of drugs or alcohol or something like that, I definitely will say that her words don't ring super true to me. I do agree with the people who feel that way. But once again, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. She could just be feeling awkward because she's got a camera in her face. Um, but if she is acting, she's a bad actor. So what we do have here are some red flags, and those red flags come in the form of Sarah Harrelson arguing with her 10-year-old son so often and so loudly that it was something the neighbors commented on. We have a kid here, Xavier, who seemed to have the weight and responsibility of being his mother's other leg, which is a lot to put on an adolescent, to the point where it seemed like Xavier really never left the area of his home unless he was going to school. And even in school, he would make comments about how he had to get home because his mom needed him. And you have Sarah Harrelson's, you know, three-month-long silence. And then, yeah, some odd behavior from her when she does pop up in the public eye and the Facebook status thing. Maybe all of these things on their own would seem like coincidences or just random or not super relevant. But together... They tell a story that I, I don't want to be told, that I don't enjoy reading. I mean, as much as I find her suspicious, it's not like I want to find her suspicious. On June 1st, the Harrelson trailer was searched with canine units along with the rest of the Spruce Village Mobile Home Park. And on that same day, the FBI began assisting local and state law enforcement in the search. 
Even before that, hundreds of volunteers searched all over Montezuma, including nearby Diamond Lake Park, and the Poeshake County Sheriff's Office requested that residents of Montezuma hand over any surveillance footage they might have. But then, on September 30th, a farmer was mowing waterways in his soybean field a few miles outside of Montezuma when he came upon the remains of a small human body. Those remains were not confirmed to be the remains of 10-year-old Xavier Harrelson until October 15th. But even before that confirmation, Mitch Mortvet of the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation reported, quote, It appears to be that of an adolescent, and at this time, the clothing that we see on the scene, even though it's obviously soiled and stuff, is consistent with what we knew Xavier to last be wearing, end quote. Now, as it turns out, Xavier was completely nude, reportedly, and his clothes were found next to his remains. And remember that he had the clothes on, or at least near him, that he was reported to be last wearing, which was the red shirt, the pajama pants. Remember that, because we're going to come back to it. Now, even after positively confirming that these remains belong to Xavier Harrison and performing an autopsy, law enforcement has not revealed Xavier's cause of death, even, you know, over a year later, and they're so tight-lipped about the details that initially it made me wonder, like, maybe they didn't have a lot of the details. Maybe the body was too decomposed to identify cause of death. Like, we do know that in some of these situations, in some cases, the cause of death just isn't apparent and there's not maybe a lot of tissue to test, to test for, like, toxicology or things like that. So there's times when you just can't figure out the cause of death. But then law enforcement, they did announce that they were keeping the information close to their chest in case they ever had someone in custody. And then they would be able to determine if that person they had in custody was involved by how much that person knew. And if nobody knew Xavier's cause of death and only the person they had in custody knew it, that would be guilt knowledge. And that would mean that that person was involved in some way. What can you tell us about the autopsy? There's really not a lot yet that we can discuss, um, mainly because it remains unsolved. And so we're continuously working with the state medical examiner's office and state anthropologist. The Iowa DCI says they recovered all of Xavier's remains, but won't publicly reveal a cause of death. We do like to keep it close to the chest because there's probably only one person, one or two maybe, you know, out there that that knows what happened. But, like I said, it's been over a year now since Xavier was found dead, and they still haven't revealed anything, including whether or not they have suspects or persons of interest, which I believe that they do. So why aren't they saying that they do? And once again, keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to it with a theory. So if you look online at this case, it really never did get the attention nationally that, that it should have and that it deserved. I didn't hear about it until, like I said, I was researching this other case. But there are some strong opinions out there. Overall, it looks like out of all the theories, there's just a few that are the most circulated. One is that Xavier wandered off on his bike, got lost in the woods, hurt himself accidentally, and died. I don't even know (laughs) why this is a theory. I think that for me, this one is pretty much off the table because as far as I'm concerned, There's nothing to support that. It's already been made very clear that Xavier never left the area of his home, usually, typically. You know, I'm not saying he didn't on May 27th, but he never did before. And if he had hurt himself accidentally, how did he end up naked in a soybean field three miles outside of town? Where is his bike, the bike he was supposedly riding when he vanished? Did police check for the bike at his trailer? to see if Xavier had even been riding it that day? Uh, Did they check, like, dumps and out-of-the-way areas to see if someone had tossed the bike? There's no mention on whether or not his bike was found, like, with him nearby. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say it probably wasn't, or else wouldn't they have said that? Wouldn't they reported that his bike was found with him? Am I missing something? Let me, like, look this up really quick, because everything I read said nothing about the bike that he was allegedly, supposedly riding when he went missing. So let me look it up really quick, just to make sure. 
So actually, when I was looking for this bike thing, I found something else. This is from the Des Moines Register, and it says, Every morning, Kevin and Kelly Kotzer play the card game Uno in the kitchen of their rural Montezuma mobile home. And every morning, they said, they always see the boy next door, 11-year-old Xavier Harrelson riding his blue bike outside their north-facing window. I think he tries to get our daughter's attention, said Kelly Kotzer, 51. She's 10, and they play and ride bikes together all the time. I think he has a little crush on her. But on the morning of May 27th, Kevin and Kelly Kautzer didn't see Harrelson outside. I've never seen him leave the mobile home park except to go to school. By then, Montezuma schools had already started their summer vacation. Okay, so that's like telling, right? Every morning, Kelly and Kevin, they sit in their their mobile home. They play Uno. They look outside. They see Xavier riding around on his bike every morning. But not that morning. Why not that morning? Yo, dude, I did find something. (sighs) Holy shit. This confirms to me that my instincts are usually not wrong. Okay, so there's an article and it's talking about um, how, you know, the law enforcement's doing things behind the scenes and they're still working full time to find the missing boy. And they said it's been a little difficult on pinpointing an exact timeline of when Xavier was last seen and where he was seen at. Mitch Mortvet noted that Xavier's bicycle was left at the mobile home trailer where he lives with his mother. Neighbors called this suspicious since the boy was known to love his bike and ride it every day. And, you know, since his mom said he was riding his bike when he went missing and he ended up, you know, three miles outside of town. And how the hell would he get there if he was just out playing and hurt himself and died accidentally? Okay. Okay, so the bike is at the mobile home. So Sarah Harrelson saw him riding his bike. He vanished. She never saw him bring the bike back. Nobody else saw him outside riding his bike. And the bike was at his house. So that first theory that's being circulated around, you know, that it was like an accident. He accidentally hurt himself and then died and then, you know, took his clothes off and and crawled to a soybean field three miles away. Probably not true. Uh, The second theory is the one I believe, that Xavier was accidentally killed by his mother, Sarah, during their loud argument in their trailer the night before his disappearance. And I will also say, you know, I don't know if I need to say this, but I definitely don't think Xavier was riding his bike around on the morning of May 27th. I think whatever happened to him went down the evening before because he was found wearing his pajamas. And his mother said she saw him riding his bike around 11 a.m. on the 27th. But pajamas are, you know, something you you usually would wear at night, right? Like something you go to bed in. And if Xavier was getting up to ride his bike in the morning, especially in the summer, I feel like he probably would have just thrown on a pair of shorts. You know, maybe he would keep the red shirt on, but just thrown on a pair of shorts or a pair of like track pants or something instead of going out in his pajamas, right? Xavier riding his bike on the morning of May 27th is corroborated by not one other person. And this is a location where the trailers are pretty close together. People are sitting outside or standing outside. People are sitting by their windows playing Uno, you know, whatever. Not one other person saw him that morning. Now, one Reddit user claims that they have lived in Montezuma their whole lives and they were actually classmates with Xavier's brother. And this person said, quote, First of all, the family friend reported him missing after an entire day of no Xavier because Sarah refused to report him missing herself. However, there is no way that Sarah is solely responsible. Sarah had extremely limited mobility. My former classmate repeatedly missed class to take care of her. She was also heavily into drugs, which is a huge, huge problem in Montezuma and the town surrounding it. I think it's possible that she killed him during a spat, but there is no way she would be able to move his body anywhere without an accomplice. I think most people around believe that Sarah killed him and the boyfriend dumped the body, which is pretty reasonable assumption, but his cause of death has not been released, so there's no way to know for sure. End quote. Okay, so we've got mention of Sarah having limited mobility, so maybe you need a second party to help you. There was mention of a boyfriend. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And there's mention of Sarah being involved with drugs. And it does look like drugs, specifically meth, are a big problem in Montezuma and surrounding areas. I even reached out to you all in my community page and chatted with some people who live in the area, and this was confirmed by every single one of them. Um, Not one person said like, oh, no, I don't 
don't know about drugs being a problem. Everybody was like, yeah, it definitely is. So, I mean, it's definitely a problem in Montezuma. And in general, this is an Iowa issue. An October 2022 article on iowastatedaily.com claims that the state leads the country in meth usage, reporting that in 2021, there were upwards of 150,000 grams of meth seized from Iowans. And that equals roughly 331 pounds of meth. This appears to have been an issue in Iowa for quite a while, and it's only getting worse. I read a 2004 article titled Meth Makers Hide Labs in Unusual Places, and this was actually referring to a meth lab that was found on a picturesque lot overlooking Lake Ponderosa, which happens to be just four miles away from where Xavier lived. This article says, quote, A lakefront lab is unusual, but it's hardly the only odd hiding place on the long, sometimes bizarre list of places Iowa meth users have found to cook the drug. In recent weeks, Iowa authorities have found a meth lab in an old combine in Palmer. They used a backhoe to uncover a cave-like meth lab under the concrete remains of an abandoned rendering plant near Mason City, discovered a meth lab in a DeWitt motel after someone noticed a chemical smell wafting from one of the rooms, end quote. This article goes on to list even more places that meth labs have been discovered, from the basement of a Marshalltown retirement home to an apartment on the square in Indianola to a bait shop across the street from the Johnston Police Department, in school playgrounds, culverts, under bridges, and in secluded areas like public parks. At that time, Iowa ranked second in the nation in reported meth labs, with more than 1,200 being found just that year. And according to the National Drug Intelligence Center in Texas, Iowa had 501 meth lab incidents by the end of April 2004, which was up from the previous year, where in that same time period, they'd had only 417 incidents, which still seems like a lot to have by April you know, which is only four months into the year. That's bananas to me. Law enforcement even started to see meth labs hidden in car trunks and pickup beds, with the chief deputy of Powashike County saying, quote, we're finding more mobile labs now. They've got the technique down. They're not cooking in town because of the smell and odor, so now they're taking them out on the road, end quote. And it also does seem like in recent years, the meth cookers of Iowa have taken a back seat. There's definitely still people cooking meth. There's definitely still meth labs, but there seem to be less of them only because the drug has been steadily flowing into the state from Mexico. Just last month, October of 2022, law enforcement seized more than 90 pounds of meth and 23 pounds of fentanyl, and they arrested three men. One man was from Iowa and two men were from Mexico who had been involved in this Mexico-based drug trafficking organization. The Department of Justice press release that I found says, quote, starting no later than January 2021 and continuing until August 2021, a Mexico-based source of supply provided Levi Dull with at least 42 pounds of methamphetamine that was imported from Mexico. In the spring or early summer of 2021, Dull owed money to the Mexico-based organization, so his supplier enlisted Ruben Vasquez, a citizen of Mexico to give Dahl a pound of meth, provided he could pay for it. Dahl could then sell the meth and use the proceeds to repay his debt. Vasquez distributed at least 11 pounds of meth to Dahl. At some point in the early summer of 2021, the Mexico-based supplier directed Chinchelas Sanchez, a citizen of Mexico, to travel to Waterloo, Iowa and assist in distributing meth to Dahl. He distributed at least 30 pounds to Dull. On August 14, 2021, Dull distributed a substance containing fentanyl that eventually resulted in two men overdosing, with one of the men dying as a result. End quote. Um, So, yeah, this is bad. It's clearly a problem in this area. And then, literally, as I was researching Xavier's disappearance and death, I got a news alert about Sarah Harrelson who is to be arraigned next month after being arrested and accused alongside another woman of selling meth to an undercover police officer in Polk County, Iowa. So I think it's pretty safe to say that Xavier's mother was involved in some sketchy stuff. If she was a meth user herself, that does not bode well for her parental responsibilities. 
I definitely can say with confidence that if Sarah Harrelson was actively using meth, she definitely was running in the wrong crowd. And there is some evidence for that. Evidence that Molly Tibbetts' killer would try to use to his advantage to argue his innocence. And we're going to get there in a second. But first, I would like to mention that, as I said before, I think it's very unlikely that Xavier's death was an accident, you know, that Sarah had nothing to do with. The police have kept everything quiet, but they did say that his death looks suspicious, which, duh. And the mayor of Montezuma, Jackie Bolin, said, quote, I think everyone is very anxious about Xavier receiving some justice. This wasn't an accident, and I think everyone is pretty much on the same page, end quote. I think you're right, Mayor Bolin. It definitely at least wasn't an accident that Xavier got himself into all alone. Now, given that Montezuma is so close to Brooklyn, Iowa, and given that the disappearance and murder of Molly Tibbetts had been so widely publicized because, I mean, really, a lot of people in that area came out to look for her when she went missing. So initially, the community felt a dark deja vu, like they were having to live through this highly stressful tragedy all over again. And that made them question whether or not the place that they called home was safe. But Rivera, the person allegedly responsible for Molly's death, could not have been involved with Xavier's disappearance because Christian Bahina Rivera was behind bars. In fact, the day after Xavier vanished, Rivera was being found guilty of first-degree murder in court. And I would ask that the court attendant read the jury's verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Christian Bahina Rivera, guilty of the crime of murder in the first degree. Thank you, Carrie. You may be seated, please. After the guilty verdict, Rivera was scheduled to be sentenced on July 15th, but the week before that sentencing hearing, his attorneys filed motions to not only delay his sentencing, but to also request a new trial, stating that witnesses had come forward claiming that Rivera had not killed Molly Tibbetts. Someone else had. During his trial, Rivera actually took the stand and testified on his own behalf, which a lot of people were surprised by because his English wasn't too great, but he had an interpreter. And that's why I think you always see him wearing headphones because I think that whatever's happening in court, an interpreter is repeating in Spanish in his ear. But when he got on the stand, he told what many people considered to be a crazy and unbelievable story. Rivera claimed that on the day of Molly's murder, he was at his home. He went and he took a shower. And when he exited the bathroom, he found two masked men wearing dark sweaters in his living room. He said that one man was bigger and that bigger man was holding a gun and one man was smaller and the smaller man was holding a knife. And they told him that if he followed their directions, if he did what they told him to do and he didn't do anything stupid, he would be fine. The two men directed Rivera to get into his car, his dark-colored Chevy Malibu, and drive them to Brooklyn, Iowa, where they encountered Molly Tibbetts jogging. They told Rivera to drive past Molly multiple times as they ducked down out of sight in the car. And at one point, they told him to stop the car. And the smaller man with the knife got out and he began walking down the road towards town in the same direction that Molly was headed. The smaller man was gone for roughly 10 to 12 minutes while Rivera and the bigger man with the gun waited in the car. And the man with the gun at one point whispered, come on, Jack. When the smaller man returned to the car, he got inside and he told Rivera to keep driving, which Rivera did for a short distance before he was told to stop again. And they pulled over and the men got out of the car. At that point, Rivera claims he heard them put something in his trunk and then they got back in his car and they told him to keep driving down a gravel road until they arrived at a cornfield. These two men then got out of Rivera's car. They took his keys and his cell phone and they told him not to say a word to anyone or his girlfriend and young daughter would be in danger, and then they left on foot. Well, because Rivera didn't have his keys, he couldn't drive away, so he said he started looking for his car keys, and he decided to check the trunk of his car, and that's when he saw the body of Molly Tibbetts in the trunk with his keys and his cell phone next to her. Rivera said that he didn't know what to do, and he didn't call the police and report this because he knew he was in the United States illegally, and he would either be deported or the police would not believe him when he said he had nothing to do with Molly's murder, which, once again, duh, because you have her dead body in your trunk and the story you're telling is kind of 
unbelievable. So Rivera said he decided to dump Molly's body in the cornfield and then cover her with corn stalks so that she wouldn't be too exposed to the sun. He then left Molly's cell phone, her Fitbit, and her earbuds on the side of the road, and he left. Now, I want to touch on one detail that I mentioned during the series of events that Rivera claims happened that day when the smaller man got out of the car and followed Molly and the bigger man whispered, come on, Jack, allegedly. It seemed that for a while, Rivera's defense team was trying to raise reasonable doubt by suggesting that Molly's boyfriend, Dalton Jack, could have been responsible or involved with her murder. And honestly, I do have to give this defense team props because I'm not a huge fan fan of defense lawyers who, you know, like for a living get murderers and rapists and stuff off. Like it's just my bias. I have to be honest about that. I try to be understanding and I try to, you know, understand that's their job. And But it's hard sometimes um, when you know someone is guilty and, and it feels like their defense team was just really good and, and able to get them off. <laughs> Jose Bias, Casey Anthony. But I got to give Jennifer and Chad some, you know, acknowledgement here because they clearly go very hard for their clients and they dug up some stuff on Dalton Jack that very well could have provided the jury with some reasonable doubt. Apparently, like I said, Dalton and Molly had been dating since he was a senior in high school and she was a junior in high school. And while Molly was in college, she and Dalton had more of a long-distance relationship, but they still made sure to see each other every weekend and even sometimes during the week if it was possible. Now, during the trial, it was revealed that Dalton Jack had referred to Molly as the love of his life. Yet he'd been cheating on her, which I guess she had discovered before her death when the woman he was with, like cheating on her with, had notified Molly about Dalton's infidelity. And then Molly went through Dalton's phone while he was sleeping to confirm. Also, reportedly, Dalton only had tried to call Molly once after she went missing. So all of that didn't really look good for him. And I really think the defense was just trying to pose an alternate suspect, even though the police had verified Dalton's alibi and confirmed that he was out of town at the time of Molly's abduction. But I suppose that wouldn't necessarily exclude him from possibly being involved if he was working with another party. But I mean, allegedly the police looked into this, they confirmed an alibi, they didn't think he had anything to do with it. And honestly, just cheating on your girlfriend doesn't mean that you want to murder her, you know, maybe even less so because you'll know that after she's dead, the police are gonna look into you as they should because it's it's oftentimes the romantic partner and they're gonna find out you were cheating and it's gonna look bad. So it makes him like not, not the best boyfriend, but it doesn't make him necessarily a murderer. And as it turns out, not long after a guilty verdict came back, For Rivera, the defense was handed an even better alternate suspect, someone who could connect Molly Tibbetts to a more recent missing persons case, Xavier Harrelson. Reportedly, after seeing Christian Bejina Rivera testify to his masked men story on television, two witnesses contacted the police independent of each other, allegedly, and they both claimed that the same man had confessed to them that he had been involved with the murder of Molly Tibbetts. The first person to come forward was Arnie Maki, an inmate at Mount Pleasant Prison. Maki claimed that another inmate he had done time with, a man named Gavin Jones, had told him that he'd been responsible for Molly's death, along with another man, Dalton Hansen, which is crazy that one of these guys is named Dalton, like Molly's boyfriend. Um, I didn't think that was a super common name, but maybe it is in Iowa. Anyways, Gavin Jones and Dalton Hansen, they were both in their early 20s. Uh, They'd grown up together in the small town of Sigourney, Iowa. They'd been friends on and off for about two years, and they'd both done time together in Keokok County Jail at the same time as Arnie Mackey. Mackey claimed that Gavin Jones had told him that Molly had been abducted for the purposes of human trafficking. She'd been bound and gagged and held in a trap house owned by a 50-year-old man named James Lowe. Now, allegedly, when Molly's disappearance drew so much local and national attention and the search for her got too close, Gavin Jones and Dalton Hansen were instructed to kill her. They were directed to do this 
by this trafficker, the owner of the trap house, and I guess he told them to stab Molly and dump her body near a Hispanic male to make it look as if that Hispanic male had committed the murder. Maki said at first he thought this was just prison talk, bluster, so he didn't pay too much attention to it. But then he heard Rivera's testimony, you know, about the two masked men who had forced him to drive them around so they could grab Molly and kill her, leaving Rivera to dispose of the body, and then obviously leaving Molly's blood and DNA in the trunk of his car, ultimately setting him up for the murder. And Arnie Maki was like, oh, maybe, you know, Gavin Jones was being serious about this. Maybe he was telling the truth. And then a woman named Lindsay Marie Voss also went to law enforcement and told them a very similar story. And apparently it turns out that Voss was the ex-girlfriend of Gavin Jones. And she claims that one day they were in the car when Jones held a gun to her head and confessed to killing Molly, saying, quote, that Mexican shouldn't be in jail because I raped and killed her, end quote. Court documents show that Voss was later granted a restraining order against Jones on June 11, 2021, right around the time she came forward with this information. Now, the prosecution dismissed all of this new evidence, claiming they'd been aware of this alleged confession during the trial, and despite what the defense claimed, they'd been aware of it as well. So basically, like, both the prosecution and the defense knew about Arnie Mackey's claims, and, you know, no one had thought at the time that these claims held any water. Scott Brown, the prosecutor, claimed there was zero evidence to back up these allegations, and information from the two witnesses didn't even match up with Rivera's version of events. Rivera had made no mention of Molly being held at a second location for an extended period of time. The way he had made it seem is that the two men grabbed her while she was jogging on the day she went missing. And on that same day, they murdered her, like within, you know, the half hour, 45 minutes, and then left Rivera to dispose of her body. And then Rivera's defense team dropped a bombshell, claiming this new information could support a connection between Molly Tibbetts and the disappearance of Xavier Harrelson, who at that time was still just missing. They hadn't found his body yet. It was noted that a person who had previously been investigated in connection with a human trafficking ring had also recently been looked into as being possibly involved with Xavier's disappearance. And that person, Rivera's defense team, was referring to is James Lowe, the man who allegedly owned the trap house where Molly had been held and who also happened to be the ex-boyfriend of Sarah Harrelson, Xavier's mother. Chad and Jennifer Frey's claimed that it had come to their attention after Rivera's trial that Lowe had been accused of abducting a young woman, drugging her, and holding her in his home for the purposes of sex work, like forcing her to do sex work, just two months before Molly Tibbetts vanished. Jennifer Frey's said, quote, This woman indicated that she was in a room by herself, but that she could hear voices of other women and voices of men. And Lo, talking in the morning, saying, Did you have a good time? Was it worth it? This woman was deemed credible, as law enforcement requested from a magistrate a search warrant, and they were granted a search warrant for James Lowe's residence. End quote. Chad Fraze claimed that the prosecution and the investigators had never provided the defense with information about James Lowe, the allegations against him, or any investigation that he had been a subject of, and Chad believed that if they had, it would have been exculpatory evidence for his client, saying, quote, they had two years prior to trial. They sat on the information, end quote. So then Jennifer and Chad Fraze made some statements that some may feel are fueled by conspiracy theory. Chad said that it was odd that such a small rural area had so many reported abductions, saying, quote, there's something rotten within this area and they don't want to provide us with any information, end quote. Jennifer Fraze continued on the same vein, stating, quote, we have information that three people have vanished out of thin air in this small rural county. Molly Tibbetts, Xavier Harrelson, and the woman that reported being abducted in May of 2018 and, and sex trafficked, end quote. And I suppose her point in saying this is, hey, if two of these people can be connected to James Lowe, which Xavier and this unnamed woman are, then it's not a huge stretch to consider that James Lowe may have been connected to Molly Tibbetts as well. And then when I was reading the document that outlined the defense's argument for why Rivera should get a new trial, I came upon this paragraph. Quote, 
a further development has come to light. The Christiane Bahena Rivera defense team has researched missing persons cases close to Brooklyn, Iowa. It has come to light that in the past few years, there are at least 10 children missing from Powashake County or counties immediately adjoining. The most recent missing child case involved Xavier Harrelson. Through investigation, it has been discovered that James Lowe was one of Sarah Harrelson's paramours. They resided together for a period of time. An eviction was filed against James Lowe and Sarah Harrelson on December 4, 2019, as living together at 207 South 2nd Street, Montezuma, Iowa. Independent investigations by the defense has revealed that James Lowe may have been one of the last people to be near Xavier Harrelson before his disappearance, end quote. So I'm actually going to come back to this claim, the 10 missing children claim. I do want to discuss that towards the end of the video, so stay tuned. Um, as far as James Lowe being one of the last people to see Xavier Harrelson, as this document said, this came from an independent investigation. I don't have the details of that independent investigation, but I do feel like if lawyers are going to make claims like that, they're going to have to back them up, you know, at least to a judge. So it could possibly be true. So Scott Brown, the prosecutor on Rivera's case, he was kind of like pissed off and he said it was unconscionable for the defense lawyers to publicly reveal information about the ongoing investigation into Xavier's whereabouts because remember Xavier is still missing at this point. He has not been found dead yet. And Scott Brown also said that Xavier was not connected to Molly's death. But as it turns out, it was true that police were investigating James Lowe. And just four days after Xavier's remains were positively identified, ATF searched a home in New Sharon, Iowa, about 13 miles away from where Xavier lived, and this home belonged to James Lowe. Now, officials initially stated that the search was connected to Xavier, but later they revised that statement, saying, quote, to say it was directly related would not be accurate, end quote. But you're not saying it's not related. You didn't say, hey, maybe we initially said it was related, but we were wrong. It's not related. They're just like, that's not like completely accurate. Basically, from what I understand, ATF was there to search the home for a federal firearms case, but state investigators who were on Xavier's case were present at the time that James Lowe's house was searched because of Lowe's connection to Xavier. So, it is technically connected. Like that search was technically connected because you had a concern that something could be found in, in Lowe's home that, you know, was related to Xavier's disappearance. But reading this original article from News Channel 6, it is curious because it seems as if the police were looking for James Lowe right after Xavier went missing. The article says, quote, Lowe was charged with possession of a National Firearms Act firearm not registered to the possessor after a vehicle he was driving was found to allegedly contain a sawed-off shotgun. The firearm discovery was made after Iowa County Sheriff's deputies found Lowe and his vehicle in Marengo on May 29th. End quote. So my question would be, why were Iowa sheriff's deputies looking for James Lowe on May 29th? Was it because they wanted to question him about Xavier's disappearance? Maybe they already had information by that time that he could have been involved or known something about it. And that's when they found the shotgun. I don't know. Possible. We still don't know Xavier's cause of death, but I'd be curious to know if it involved a gun. So James Manuel Lowe is currently in jail after pleading guilty to possession of an unregistered firearm, and he was sentenced to 37 months in prison and three years of supervised release. According to his charging documents, that guilty plea was entered into record on August 25th, 2021. Uh, the month before they found Xavier's body. Lowe also has a lot of stuff in his criminal background. He's got convictions for larceny, forgery, wrongful destruction, unlawful possession of prescription drugs, eluding, possession of methamphetamine, burglary, theft, and possession of drug paraphernalia. At the time that James Lowe was found in possession of that sawed-off shotgun in May, right after Xavier went missing, he was an active drug user. So, Based on all of this new information, 
Rivera's defense team requested that the prosecution turn over all information they had on James Lowe, as well as any information they had on human trafficking operations and investigations in the area where Molly Tibbetts lived and died around the time where she was abducted. Jennifer and Chad Fraze said they needed time to investigate these new witness claims, and they believed that if they'd had this information during the trial, the outcome of the trial could potentially have been different. Now, the prosecution called this a fishing expedition, and they also alleged that previous jailhouse statements made by Arnie Mackey had been passed on to the defense before the trial, but at that time, the defense had been uninterested in the story because it didn't match up with Rivera's version of events. But once he was found guilty, they pulled it out as a last resort, you know, because they didn't want to introduce it into the first trial because it would make it seem like, well, it doesn't match. Like those two stories don't match. So it may have looked worse for him. So they didn't want to risk that. But once he was found guilty, they were like, well, let's now introduce this and, and hope for a Hail Mary. Prosecutor Scott Brown said, quote, they want to go and knock themselves out trying to find out all of this confusing information that's just been presented to the court. Go right ahead and do it. But there's nothing in the rules, nothing in the case law that compels the state to chase its tail because they're asking us to do it, end quote. So Judge Joel Yates agreed to delay the sentencing hearing while he considered whether or not to order a new trial, but he did deny the defense defense's request to turn over information about trafficking operations and investigations in the area, also calling their efforts a fishing expedition. The Associated Press then reached out to both Gavin Jones and Dalton Hansen. Remember, those are the two guys that Arnie Mackey said were, I guess, the masked men who killed Molly Tibbetts. And both of these men claimed they had no involvement in Molly's murder, they didn't know James Lowe, and no one had ever reached out to speak to them. However, they were eager to get the story straight. Gavin Jones said, quote, The cops haven't talked to me. No one has talked to me. You are the first person that has called me. I wasn't involved in anything. I have alibis in everything. I'm just waiting for someone to come talk to me. End quote. However, when asked if he'd ever made prior statements about Molly Tibbetts and her death, Jones did not answer. 24-year-old Dalton Hansen said he has no idea how his name even got involved in the case, and he called the allegations crazy. Chad Fraze, Rivera's lawyer, he said that both Jones and Hansen had criminal records with incidences of violent crimes, and he announced that he wasn't surprised the two men claimed the charges were false, saying, quote, they aren't going to stand up and say they did it, end quote, which I mean, fair. In August of 2021, Judge Joel Yates denied the defense's request for a new trial. He claimed that Rivera had failed to meet the legal burden of showing that the substance of the new evidence was discovered after the guilty verdict or even that it would have made a difference. It was found out that evidence about Jones allegedly confessing to the murder of Molly Tibbetts was in fact known to the defense team prior to the trial coming to a close. So that was true. They had knowledge of that before their client was found guilty. And even if the evidence was not discovered, quote, the alleged confession of Gavin Jones would not have changed the result of the trial. Defendant in his motion greatly downplays the discrepancies between his testimony at trial and the account that the other inmate reports he was told by Jones. It's reasonable to conclude that the jury would have decided either Jones or the defendant was not being truthful, end quote. So my take on this is that Rivera is probably guilty of killing Molly Tibbetts because there's a lot that just doesn't add up with his other story, the masked men story. And I feel that if Molly had been held in a trap house for the purposes of sex, even for a short time, there would have been some sign of that on her autopsy. There would have been some sign of sexual assault, bruises from where she was apparently like gagged and bound. And if there was examples of that on her autopsy report, I feel like Rivera's defense team would have had access to that information and they would have definitely used it to support their claims. Although I will say... If I was on the jury and I heard this information, like the James Lowe and Sarah Harrelson connection, it may have given me pause. And I will also say that I don't believe the James Lowe information was in the possession of Rivera's legal team before the trial came to an end. I think like the Arnie Mackey thing was, but I think that the James Lowe thing was new information, which they only looked into when Xavier Harrelson went missing which happened, once again, just the day before Rivera was found guilty. So the trial was basically over when Xavier went missing. On that note, 
Although the judge and the prosecution don't believe that James Lowe is relevant to Molly's case, it doesn't mean that he isn't relevant to Xavier's disappearance and death. Both James Lowe and Sarah Harrelson were clearly using and or selling meth at this time. James Lowe was clearly involved with selling it, in my opinion, allegedly, and now we find out that Sarah Harrelson, she's selling it too. And we've talked about this in previous cases, but meth is a terrible drug, a terrible drug, a true blight on society. And I I really don't want to hear shit in the comments about not stigmatizing meth users because they shouldn't be stigmatized. They should be. We shouldn't make excuses for them or help them to feel less shame for what they're doing because meth users not only hurt themselves, but they hurt those around them. And if you gave a shit about these people, you would want them to stop using meth. And so you would stop making excuses for them and you would stop making it seem like they just don't have control over themselves and they don't have control over their own lives and they're a victim. If you cared about them, you'd want them to stop using meth because it it doesn't go any place good. It ends with death, basically. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people, but it does mean a healthy degree of shame is needed to hopefully kickstart them into making a change. Now, if you come at me and judge me for stating the obvious that meth is bad and people who use it are known to do bad things to themselves and others, yet you continue to make excuses for the people using meth and protect them as if they're little children who can't handle facts, you're an enabler And you're not helping. You're not helping them. You're not helping their family members, their children. You're not helping society as a whole. You are hurting everything. And I would invite you to sit down and have a conversation with anyone who had to grow up with a meth user as a parent. Many people had to grow up with two meth users as parents and then ask them how their childhood was. Ask them how safe and happy they felt and how, you know, how much trauma they have now, basically. You can't throw a blanket defense over something that has a huge and real impact on the lives of others, especially if you've never been personally involved, if you've never personally been victimized. It's like saying that, you know, serial killers clearly have something wrong with them. Like, they clearly can't help themselves, so therefore, serial killing is not wrong. No, no, that's not true. People who use meth are addicted. There's a physical and mental and even emotional dependency on the drug, and they are out of control, but they can regain control and they can get help. They can choose to get help. A lot of people do, and you're not helping them by enabling them and making excuses for them. And I'm really only saying this because the last time we covered a case where the perpetrator was on meth and ended up, you know, killing their child, I made these same statements, and I was kind of stunned at the backlash. Because who would have thought that saying meth users don't make the best parents, who would have thought that would be a hot or controversial take? Like, It's crazy. Sometimes it seems like some of y'all just want to watch the world burn. It's so weird. Holding somebody accountable, uh, making them responsible for their own lives and their own actions is never a bad thing. Yes, I'm sure no one starts doing meth and is like, I I love doing meth and I I know I'm going to hurt my kids and I don't care. Yet, that's still what happens. You have to take some accountability and feel some negative feelings about the bad shit you do so that you stop doing it. You know, meth users are selfish. They are. They live for that highly addictive rush. The only thing they're focused on is that next high. And quote, this can endanger children in several ways. First of all, it affects the parent's focus on the child's needs. Second, it potentially exposes the children to unsafe people, drug dealers, and other adults on meth, and exposes them to dangerous places like meth houses and labs. End quote. Oh no, this academic paper said that other meth users, other adults on meth are dangerous people. Let's let's cancel them. Dangerous people like James Lowe, perhaps. Dangerous people like Sarah Harrelson herself, perhaps. Let's talk about what happens when a person uses meth. Usually after a single dose, the high can last around 6 to 12 hours. People under the influence can become aggressive, irritable, or overconfident and grandiose. Quote, in many ways, 
this stage resembles the mania that a person with bipolar disorder might experience. Users may behave in bizarre, violent, and or unexplainable ways which can be distressing to those around them. End quote. Imagine how distressing it is to small children who depend on their parents to be reliable, to be consistent in their, their behavior. Imagine how traumatic that is, how horrible that is for a 10-year-old like Xavier. But then we have the binging and tweaking phase where a meth high can be extended for days, even weeks, by repeated binging. But then the person isn't sleeping. They don't sleep or rest for days. And that's when they start tweaking. Quote, at this point, the user's dopamine reserves are entirely exhausted. And he or she is incapable of experiencing euphoria as he or she previously did. People tend to become increasingly irritable, angry, paranoid, anxious, and confused at this point. Many sources indicate that tweaking is the most dangerous stage of meth use, end quote. Is it hard to consider and wonder that Xavier may have been dealing with a parent who was oftentimes aggressive, irritable, angry, and violent, which is why the neighbors always heard Sarah yelling at him, and why he was maybe trying to spend the night at other people's trailers because maybe he didn't feel safe with his own mother in his own home. Now, some people have mentioned that because Xavier was undressed, this actually points away from a parent being responsible. But I don't necessarily think so. I mean, I think maybe that's what the person who's responsible for Xavier's death wanted you to think. <laughs> I could be wrong, and the police could have information that Xavier had been sexually assaulted, but... I also feel like if that was the case, law enforcement probably should have given the public more information by now because that would mean that there was a violent maniac on the loose snatching kids, assaulting them, and killing them. And you'd think there'd be some safety issues at hand if law enforcement just kept that to themselves and didn't warn parents to keep a closer eye on their children in the weeks and months after Xavier was found. I would have a very big problem with this law enforcement agency if we come to find out that Xavier was sexually abused and um, they didn't say anything, you know, because in, in that case, it would probably point away from a parent and towards like a stranger, a predator. But then that means you got a stranger predator running around, possibly getting ready to do that to someone else. And that's crazy to me that the police wouldn't reveal it. So that's why I think that didn't happen. And, you know, the police weren't even saying like, oh, everyone be careful, like keep an eye on your children. It's almost like they kind of know. Who did it? And they just don't have enough, like, proof or evidence yet, kind of like Summer Wells' case. It's likely that whoever did this removed Xavier's clothing as a red herring to throw law enforcement off the scent and have them looking for some stranger predator instead of looking closer to home. And that's not to say that there are not incidences of human trafficking in Iowa involving, you know, kids even. And over the past couple of years, a number of trafficking cases have been prosecuted in Iowa's federal courts with three new cases being opened up in 2022. And these three new cases, I'm not going to go over them right now because this video is already super long. But yeah, uh, one of them did involve children and basically uh, an individual drugging children so that they could do things to children and, and have other people do things to children. So it, it happens. It happens everywhere because we know that human trafficking is a world problem, not an Iowa problem or an America problem. It happens everywhere, every day. And I'm not even going to dismiss the possibility that James Lowe may have been involved in something like that, like human trafficking, something like Rivera's defense team accused him of being involved in. And we do, you know, apparently have a statement from a woman who claimed that James Lowe kept her in his house for weeks, subjecting her to sexual assault from different men every night, which is sick. I don't know if what she says is true, but if it is, like, why is that dude not in prison for life? But anyways, in my opinion, this just strengthens the possibility that James Lowe was involved with either the murder of Xavier or the disposal of his body. Maybe he helped Sarah, and maybe that's why she's out there selling meth right now, getting caught by undercover police officers. Because maybe James Lowe helped her with something that, you know, she doesn't want to get out. And he's only going to keep her secret if she works for him. Similar to that one situation we talked about earlier where that guy owed money for drugs. So they just forced him to work off his debt by, like, selling drugs to other people. Meth laced with fentanyl, by the way. What's – oh, we need to talk about the fentanyl problem someday because it's real bad. But this is just the theory I have, okay? I'm not saying that this actually happened. This is all alleged. Just a theory. I have no actual evidence 
besides all the stuff that looks really bad and suspicious, okay? It looks really bad and suspicious. And normally, I would keep my theory to myself, um, but, but here it feels overpowering. It feels like it would be wrong not to bring this up. And I really feel strongly about this one. I feel that Xavier's mother knows what happened to him. Um, I hope that maybe now she's in custody, they can strike a deal with her. Like maybe if she gives them information on James Lowe, maybe, you know, she'll be able to tell them the truth and, and only see some jail time. I don't know. But I really hope we find out what happened to Xavier and I really hope that his death is solved soon because he did seem like such a sweet, innocent kid who didn't deserve this. He seems so sweet. And I really wish that he'd made it to Des Moines and to his grandmother, Mary Weber's house. I really wish. I mean, he was like the end of the month, man. And he was going to be there amongst family and other people who could keep an eye on him. I really, really wish that he'd made it there. And I'm just sick to my stomach about this. I really hate talking about these cases involving kids, but, you know, at the same time, I, I know they need to be talked about, but I really hate talking about them because it makes me very sad. I love children. I would hang out with kids any day over adults um, just because they're, you know, they're fun. They are innocent. They make you forget your troubles, and they have this really, like, unadulterated, unspoiled view of humanity and the world, and it's awesome. And it, it reminds you of a time when you kind of felt that way. And I no longer have this unspoiled view of humanity in the world, and I can be quite jaded. So hanging out with my kids makes me feel less jaded. It makes me feel more pure and like, like the kid that I was once. I remember her. I don't recognize her sometimes, but I remember her. I hate to talk about this. I hate when it's a parent involved even more. If Sarah Harrelson was responsible or involved with what happened to Xavier, I can't stand to think about what his last moments were like because he was there for his mother. He seemed to be genuinely caring about her. He seemed to really be like, you know, a helper to her at a sacrifice to himself. It's sad to think that he, he sacrificed and gave so much of his life to her, which should be the other way around, for it to only be taken from him. It's so sad. I do also want to address the claim that Rivera's defense team made about 10 missing children. So I did go to the website that lists all the missing persons in Iowa. And I will say, like, there were actually a lot of kids missing. So many that I started, like, writing them down and listing them in my notes and saying, like, what their ages were and when they were reported missing and where they went missing from. And I had to stop because there were just so many. I noticed that they were all listed as going missing really recently. Um, like November 4th through the 15th, stuff like that. And, you know, there, there's kids of all types. There's boys and girls, all different races, black, white, uh, Hispanic. There was, I believe, two Native American kids in there, all different ages, ranging from really young. I think the youngest I saw was four to teenagers, like 17 years old. And I was like, what is going on here? What am I missing is this correct? Because I remembered that when the defense made that statement, um, one of those like weird fact checker websites, which why do they exist? <laughs> why are you <laughs> the end all be all of like what's true or not? These fact checker websites. But one of them popped into the conversation and they were like, no, that's not true. The only missing kid at that time was Xavier Harrelson. And that was absolutely not true. Because I fact checked the fact checker website and found them to be lacking. Uh, I don't know. Maybe all of these kids that I'm seeing are runaways, but there's a lot of them, man. And some of them are young, like 11, 13. I'm going to put like a, a video of me scrolling through this while I'm talking about it. I don't know. They didn't have any of their pictures up. Like maybe, maybe all of these kids are runaways. Um, I was reading something when Xavier went missing where uh, a state official was like, oh, you guys are wrong. Like these kids aren't missing. They're runaways. And then I'm like, well, if they ran away and you don't know where they are, aren't they still missing? Like, is it is it impossible to think that a kid could run away and then encounter foul play while they're away from their home running away? Like, it still means they're missing, right? Oh, and then the state official, I forget her name, she said, like, and, and sometimes it looks worse than it is because some of these kids' names are in there twice because they're, like, repeat runaways. I didn't see. I maybe saw one or two of the same name repeated more than once, but the rest all seem to be like within the last few weeks and still missing. 
you know, because I, I went on the missing persons website just today and their names are still there. So I think that means they're still missing. They're still not home, you know, and that's concerning. And then I remembered Iowa also happened to be where Johnny Gosh went missing from. And if you remember, there are some bizarre theories that surround his abduction. In fact, um, I actually was going to cover Johnny Gash's case years ago. Years ago, I spoke to his mother, Noreen. Um, and then I started, well, I don't want to talk about I, Basically, it scared me. But I think I might revisit it. Let me know if you want me to. It's such a big case. It's such a daunting task. Um, but let me know if that is something you would like me to cover. But basically, the theory around around Johnny Gash was that he had been taken by some like government human trafficking ring. And at first I was like, yeah, right. But then I read this one book where there's all sorts of evidence linking Johnny to this like federal credit union thing. Like, just trust me. It's it's scary to think about. And then I also remembered um, that Jody Hosentrut was went missing from Iowa, you know. So there's like some pretty prolific missing persons coming out of that state. And then I remembered a case I was researching months ago about two little girls, cousins, who went missing. They were later found dead. And I remember when I was researching that case, it was a rough time in my life. That case felt really heavy. I felt myself getting really down about it. And it was at the same time Derek and I were covering Summer Wells on the Crime Weekly podcast. So I did the majority of the research, but it was just so much man, in my heart. And so I, I put a pin in it and I put it aside. But then this week, I was researching this case and I was like, wait, didn't they go missing from Iowa too? So I went back to my notes. And yes, in fact, eight-year-old Elizabeth Collins and 10-year-old Lyric Cook Morrissey were abducted while riding their bikes in Evansdale, Iowa in July of 2013. This is yet another case where these kids go missing. They turn up dead. The police never tell you anything. And to this day, it's still not solved. And how is that possible? You know, how is that possible? And how can we prevent Xavier from becoming another child who decades later still doesn't have justice? Yeah, but anyways, this was a tough case, um, but I'm glad we covered it. This is where we're going to end the video today. I really want to know what you guys think about this case, uh, Xavier's case, as well as Molly's case. In the comment section, I'm actually working on another video about Michael Vaughn. I'm just keeping an eye on the news because they're doing some really like deep excavations currently. And I have a feeling this case is going to break open soon. But yesterday they announced that they think it's going to be like weeks before they're able to like dig enough and then sift through everything enough to actually come up with evidence. So when I have some information on what was found during these excavations, I will make a video about his case, another child who went missing. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it was worth sharing. And comment and let me know what you think or just say hi. Doing all of those things really helps my videos. Also, subscribe if you haven't already because there's a lot of you who watch my videos but haven't subscribed. And if you do subscribe, then you'll get notified whenever I post a video. So subscribe and hit that bell notification. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram if you are interested in doing so. The handles are in the description box. Also in the description box, you can find links to to my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. You can find Crime Weekly anywhere you get your audio podcasts. We also have a YouTube channel where we post video version of the podcast a couple of days after it goes live on audio platforms. Also, you can find a link to Criminal Coffee Company, the coffee company that Derek and I started last summer. Not only does Criminal Coffee taste amazing, I have to say it does, and I wouldn't lie to you because it's very easy for you to call me out on the sly and say it doesn't taste good. It does taste good. Not only does it taste amazing, but a portion of the proceeds goes to fighting crime. So for instance, at the end of last quarter, we had $5,000. I think we raised about 3500 through criminal coffee sales, and we raised it up to 5000 And then we gave that 5000 to Intermountain Forensic Labs so that they could go ahead and hopefully identify a Jane Doe known as Preble Penny. Right now, they're using these really great methods. They are grinding down the bone. They're going to try to extract DNA from the bone, um, something that they've been doing a lot in archaeological digs. And then they're going to try to find her family or somebody related to her and then find out, you know, did you have a relative who went missing at this time? 
um, in this area and things like that and hopefully find Preble Penny's real name so that she can be buried and she can, you know, have somewhat of closure to her story. So go check that out. You guys can follow Criminal Coffee too on Instagram, on TikTok, on Twitter, because we are putting updates on that Preble Penny case uh, constantly. So I'll link all that stuff in this description box too for today. So you have it. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm actually working on a multi-parter right now, a highly requested case. So that's taking some time, but I will put out other videos before that's ready to go out. But really appreciate you being here with me. And in until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very, very soon.